So uh, this ties in really well with a lot of the work we both are doing in other areas around learning and also thriving, um, thriving organizations, people thriving in organizations. And what I've loved about learning about communities of practice and then investigating them and working with them with others is this idea that it flips. It flips how we do things in our organizations and opens us up to more inclusive models more, um, and more uh, interesting models, frankly, and more productive models, right? So same with the th anybody who was at our thriving presentation. Uh, we get stuck in a certain way of leadership and a certain way of doing, and that can actually bind us in terms of uh, managing our stress and our workload. So communities of practice are challenging, and we'll say that over and over again. They're challenging because they're a bit of a flip with the usual, the default ways of doing in organizations. So let's do a little check-in and get you involved right away. Uh, and, and you can share, well, I think... Let's share at tables, if that's okay, so we get lots of voices going, uh, three or four people at a time, and share at your table what brought you to the session. Okay. So I heard four different kind of things. The idea of, well, I think I'm doing it, but I'm not sure, so I'd like to learn a little bit more and how I could do it maybe better or more effectively, or are there principles I'm missing? I heard the idea that, uh, well, what are they? So I just want to learn about them, and maybe I'll see an opportunity to use a COP somewhere. And the idea that it's a broader issue too, like we've got these big organizations or institutions, can a community of practice somehow bridge those gaps, those silos that we tend to build in our organizations or universe? Not here, like we don't do that here. But <laughs> And then um, also this idea of the energy around COPs and how they're kind of exciting and you hear the word and you think the concepts are really intriguing, but then how do you sustain that energy? Or what it, do they need to be sustained? Or what happens to communities of practice after a little while? Do they actually kind of evolve? Or just you know, go in a system and die? Or become something else? Or do they maybe struggle? So are there issues with communities of practice? What did you hear, Rebecca? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we had the question, well, wh what is a community of practice? What exactly does that mean? Because that term's been used a lot um, lately. And um, what are we actually talking about? So, um, and we're certainly going to delve into that with everyone uh, in a moment. And um, the other piece was um, around uh, understanding that many of us, well, so, you know, some of you in the room are, are participating in communities of practice, or perhaps you've done research in that area. You're interested in interdisciplinary thinking and working together, um, thinking about disciplines differently. Um, organizational structures differently. So, so those are some of the things that, uh, that were shared. It, and I think, you know, we're experiencing the same thing in the readings, but also in our experience uh, delving into communities of practice, that this idea of a silo comes up and that we're trying to bridge, but we're also trying to sustain energy and learning, learning being so central to that. How do we learn? So we'll give you a few case studies of communities of practice happening here and um, discuss some of these concepts. So uh, Jennifer and I are, um, we're interested in the mechanics of communities of practice, and we're going to be speaking ab about that quite a lot. But we're also just thinking more broadly. We're interested about how communities of practice can help organizations learn. And uh, we've, um, we've read um, quite a lot of research uh, that has been undertaken inside universities, actually asking that question. How, how can we learn inside universities in the sense of as an organization, organizational learning? And so some questions, you know, uh, communities of practice may give us a chance to think about um, our, our university and our learning broadly. So what if we were creating um, knowledge on behalf of the university? What would that look like if we were really focusing on that with communities of practice? Um, and what if we could build community outside our school, our roles, our disciplines? Um, what would that look like? And what if we could also explore our own sense of identity and understanding? What if we could rethink and uh, reimagine our, our own practice and our, our own capabilities? 
So our presentation today is based on the theory and practice of social learning, and in particular, the work of Etienne Wenger. So this um, is a book that um, I've read. I found very helpful. Some of you are nodding. Um, very interesting, practical, practical book. Um, Wenger is um, an educational theorist and practitioner. He has published widely on social learning theory. And um, the term communities of practice is widely attributed to him and also his colleague, Jean LaVey, who is a social anthropologist. And um, the term community of practice came out of some research they did together in the early 90s. So social learning brings together individual experience and the competence shared in community. And I think that's the thing to emphasize. It is that combination of individual experience and community uh, competency. So in a social learning system, uh, community competence is socially and historically defined. So what does that mean? Is socially and historically defined. So I would say our learning community here, um, we're socially and historically defined by our um, experience as a university, as collectively as Royal Roads um, colleagues, right? Um, collegially, we're, we're all together here. So we have that, that shared social and historical uh, experience. Um, and it's also defined by our common interest, um, uh, I would say today, in research and practitioner research, we could say. So in this particular group, we're, 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 we're um, defining our community competence through our, our, our um, experience at Royal Roads, our interest in research, practitioner research perhaps. And there may be, of course, several other things that are linking us together, but those are just uh, some examples. So in a community of practice, it's a group of people who share a common language. We share common Royal Roads language, right? Um, and they also share a common competency. So these uh, groups are bringing together unique experience and competencies um, within their group. So we might have a community of practice on, on uh, digital security, for example, right? That could be a very interesting community of practice. It might already have a community of practice. Um, could be on action learning and action research, establishing a community of practice on that area. There are many, many opportunities and areas of interest that we can create communities of practice around. So typically, a social learning system recognizes different levels of competency. So um, a community of practice requires a certain level of competency. You remember because you bring a certain degree of competency. And I was laughing with a friend. I said, I couldn't be in a community of practice of sommeliers, for example. I can be in a community of practice of people who like to chug some wine. <laughs> but I wouldn't bring the competency to a sommelier community of practice. So it is very much around your competency and expertise. Right? That's, a, that's a, a very defining piece. So in summary, our experience in communities is a balance of our individual experience, our competence in a community, and each of them shape each other. Okay? That's the, the dynamic that we're, we're speaking to. So how do we define a community of practice? So <laughs> I've had questions about that. <laughs> so again, um, drawing on the work of Etienne Wenger, um, the term community of practice has really resonated with uh, many different kinds of organizations, public and private sector um, institutions. Um, and the question, you know, why does it resonate? Well, I think it resonates because organizations are very challenged with how to facilitate knowledge creation right? Um, very challenged to do that. And we've kind of gone through a period of really looking at how we do that through, through systems that are kind of electronic systems, or we try and capture all the knowledge in databases and databases and information in that way. And I think we're certainly moving more to understanding that that knowledge is fluid and it's, it, it needs to be moving and changing. It's contextual as well. And, um, and that communities of practice can be a way to really um, facilitate knowledge creation. So how do they work and what has to be in place? So there's three elements to a community of practice. The first is the group has to share expertise, competency, and interest. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, uh, a group of sommeliers which would share competency in wine and an interest in wine. Um, the second one, the group has to have a productive and trusting relationship. And I really emphasize here about the community piece. So as you notice here, we've got debate and domain on the bottom, so that's the area of interest, community, and then the practice. So the community piece 
is one that we've really learned, I think, that, you know, that, that sense of engaging, committing to one another, supporting one another, really caring about one another, and, and listening deeply to the, the practice experience and the ideas and the sharing that happen in these communities is really, really critical. That's what makes it a community of practice, very much. And then the third element, the group has to apply, use, and integrate the information in that practice. So there's a strong connection to practice. You're a practitioner, and that practitioner component. And so um, I th we found this model very helpful. And um, I think it was uh, well quoted many times, where Kurt Lewin says, it's nothing as practical as good theory. And I really, really <laughs> I found that with community of practice theory. It is so useful and helpful. So I'm going to take you through this model here. This slide introduces a simple, basic model of communities of practice developed by Wengner Trainer. Um, those are two different people. Um, as a cornerstone of a social discipline of learning. So it has seven elements. You'll notice the seven elements. Now, in the center are the three central elements that we just discussed a little bit. So we have the domain, community, and practice. And as you notice, in bright orange, it says learning partnership. So these are the three components that create that vibrant learning partnership. So the first one, the domain, is what are we about? What is our shared area of interest? You know, what is this partnership about? It's the first question. And often when establishing community of practice, the first question is, why are we here? What are we about? What do we want to do? The second uh, part is the, um, the community. So how do we form a community and who should be part of it? So who should be part of this community and what will this community feel like? Um, what will happen in this community? Uh, you might go to values here, you might go to process pieces, but what is this, what is this community going to become at this stage? And then the third one is what is the practice? So what do we need to get better at? Right? That firm entrenchment in practice. And these three elements are mutually defining, so they work as a set, the three together. Okay? Um, and then the four arrows represent four distinctive constituencies. So you'll notice that there's sponsorship, support, participation, and leadership. And participation and leadership, the horizontal arrows, are inside this model because they're inside the community of practice. The sponsorship and support do not have to be inside the community. They can rest outside. So the reason for um, participation really here is it's very critical for members to want to be there. They're there because they want to be there, and there's that what's in it for me. What is my interest? What, what do I want to gain from this participation? You know, that sense. And I think that's a, a, a strong foundation of the energy that develops from a community. People are there because they want to be there. They haven't been told to be there. It's an area that they're passionate about. It's an area they want to connect with other people about. And when that happens, people tend to become very committed to the group. That commitment is generated out of that. Um, and I think the piece uh, that I'd like to share is too is, is having people that are willing and want to go the extra mile for their other community members. They want to do the, do the work because it takes work, <laughs> right? Um, and then the other part, so participation is critical and, and also leadership. And we'll be speaking a little bit about leadership because um, I have questions about leadership in community of practice that I certainly haven't figured out. I have questions around a lot of these areas. But certainly with leadership, it's a very soft leadership. Uh, you know, how do you define leadership? It's a very shared, collaborative, facilitative kind of leadership. It's really about enabling everyone around the table to have their voice and share their ideas and, and help you consolidate and, and question and check in and all those things that help you kind of really uh, start to develop new knowledge around your area of interest. So in summary, we've got seven developmental elements. And um, we're, these are all part of, of cultivating a community of practice. Uh, support and sponsorship we'll talk about a little bit later when we're sharing our, our case studies. But essentially, we want to understand these are some questions that can help. What is the participation about? Who should be at the table? What should they do together? How should they communicate together? Um, how are the members at the table going to benefit? And uh, who will take leadership? I think it's a big question. Um, who are the external stakeholders? And um, what kind of resources and support is available? So those are some preliminary questions that can help when you're starting to establish yourselves. 
And I'm now going to turn over to Jen. Right, so we'll be sharing a few examples in a little while, but I want to unpack this a little bit further because it ties in, as I mentioned, to this idea of how do we thrive in organizations. The pace of change seems to be increasing. The workload always seems to be increasing. It doesn't seem like stress is going to go away anytime soon. The workload just continues to increase. And rather than manage the, that stress, I think we really need to find a way to thrive within it, right? Strengthen the face of adversity. There's lots of theory and research around these kinds of topics. And what we've learned through our thriving research is the importance of social support, um, access to resources. They don't all exist within you. These are some core principles, which aligns really well with the, the work around communities of practice. Everything starts to connect, right? It all uh, intersects. And so this idea that, you know, you want to have meaning and purpose, that gives you a sense of thriving within an organization. How do you achieve that? Able to focus on things you actually care about. So as an individual, you're really benefiting because you're joining a group where you feel there's meaning, there's purpose, there's direction, I can have impact and influence on something that concerns me to some degree. Uh, of course, there are then going to be benefits for the whole community and that you're learning from one another. Isabel was talking about the potential within the community, the competence within the community that you can then learn from. And imagine, we already know this. We have it embedded in our LTRM, our Learning and Teaching Research Model, that's being re-examined uh, re right now and refreshed and communicated uh, at Campus Conversation very soon. You know, there's, we know the benefits of learning in community and that it's not just about the sage on the stage, we learn from one another, of course. So we're benefiting in that way. But you're also benefiting, much like the principles of open space uh, and that Rebecca just talked about around commitment. If I'm able to join something where I'm really jazzed and that's where I, I feel like my purpose lies, of course I'm going to feel further nourished and empowered and energized, right? So it's a lot about this energy, concept of energy and creating more energy for ourselves. And doing things in a way that nourish, nourishes you and enables you to thrive. And then of course for the ben benefit of the institution is that these communities are tackling issues, they're tackling roadblocks, they're tackling um, challenges that people are experiencing across the organization. And our three examples il will illustrate that, but I want you to be thinking of that as well. You know, I know Isabel's working on the associate faculty realm. I wouldn't say it's an issue. I mean, they are an issue. But there are lots of challenges around our communications with associate faculty or how to support them better. There's all sorts of questions, right? So getting involved in that community uh, is very inspiring for certain people because that's where they live and that's where they see as a real leverage within the organization for um, enhancing our productivity, our performance, our happiness, and our ability to thrive as a community. So, so be thinking about where can you see opportunities for people to rally around a concern, an issue, an idea. It doesn't have to be a problem, right? It can be an idea that we'd like to build. And we have another one we'd like to uh, explore that has come up recently for us as well. So of course there are benefits right across. And uh, Nick was talking about, you know, bridging the silos. And we're going to have silos. We're going to have departments, units, teams, um, schools. You're always going to have that. That's part of being a system. But it's the bridging that can end up being broken or missing. Or, and how do, we, how do we achieve that? Well, these we know these work beautifully because, of course, they draw on people from all across the place, whether it's here or any other organization. And suddenly now, of course, the community the person and the institution is benefiting from those, those relationships that you're now building. And we know how important that is, especially here. So we have uh, several that we're involved in, and I'm sure there are others going on. You know, Isabel's realizing, I, I kind of have one going, right? Or I don't know if I'm calling that a community practice or not, but it feels like it has some of those elements. There's a shared interest. Uh, there's a community definitely forming around this and there is competence there from the community and um, what's the third one and, and there's obviously we're all doing things together we share that commonality and interest in our in our practice so we'll be sharing um well all of these we'll talk about each one but three of them in more depth the case research women in leadership uh the ltm program head and trends so this, this comes up in some of the readings around community practice. This, this quote struck us as so relevant to Royal Roads. <laughs> uh, as 
we are constantly facing, and not just railroads, but I think higher ed in general, facing challenges in terms of uh, resources. But that, uh, as a consultant with organizations, that is the number one concern I hear from any organization, whether they're for not-for-profit or for social profit or private, it doesn't matter. They all are struggling with these constraints or lack of resources or you know, whether it's time or actual money and, and support, it doesn't matter. And frankly, that's our world, right? We, we're living in an ecosystem that is bounded. There, is, there isn't these unlimited resources necessarily. So we need to have this mindset. And again, the community of practice, I think is a very evolutionary practice in that it is challenging us to think creatively in this way, make things count for more, leverage the in interdependence of groups, leverage the synergies that happen when people come together and share their knowledge and competence and uh, learn how to yeah, make our resources count for more. So I think that's a, a key piece of community practice as well, that we're constantly um, in, that, in that mindset of being creative and sustainable in our approaches to solving some of the challenges we see um, in our organizations. So um, I thought I'd just um, introduce that, well, the, the first community of practice is, is really how I cut my teeth on communities of practice. And um, uh, a few things I'd like to share about, about this group. Um, first of all, just a little bit about how it started, because it wasn't intentional to start a community of practice. I didn't even know what the term meant when this community of practice started. Uh, but essentially, I, I was lonely. I was learning to um, write cases. And it was very interesting case research and teaching, but I was quite lonely. And I didn't know who else was doing it. And I thought, OK, maybe we could um, bring someone in who could help. Initially, we were thinking the faculty of management help us write cases and have a shared language around cases, a shared um, appreciation and understanding about how we do that, how we research with them, how we teach with them. And um, I want to speak to the collegial aspect of this because it's an interesting story. So I had that idea, and then I went to a conference in Austin, Texas, and Charles Kruskoff was there, and. I had happened to run into, through a, you know, serendipity, a, a, a mentor who became my case writing mentor, who was from the University of Salem. And um, I met her through, uh, through someone who connected me. And she called me, and, and we were chatting. And I said, well, I'm interested in case writing. And uh, I said, but you need to know, I've just written one case. And it's not published, and it's kind of half written. <laughs> and, this, was, this is a Fulbright scholar <laughs> who, has, who has published so many cases, so well known, and, and she, she was such a wonderful mentor. And she didn't give up right that moment. She said, okay, well, what first you have to write again. And she has been so instrumental in my, in my career so far. I just adore her. So anyway, Charles, I introduced Charles to Gina Vega who was at this conference. And essentially what happened was, you know, they came back and I talked to Charles, and then Charles you know, super supportive. Why don't we, yes, let's, I like that idea, Rebecca. Let's, you know, you should let go for it. I said, well, I'm going to, I'll write a proposal. And he said, okay. And so I wrote this proposal and he helped me um, get it in front of Steve and Steve approved it. And so we had three days and what we wanted to do was to make this an interdisciplinary learning opportunity. We didn't want to make this a faculty of management piece. It was for associate faculty, for anyone in the university who wanted to come and discover and share around cases. So this is what started. Now, fast forward. Um, so after the, the workshop, at the end, no one wanted to um, disband. You know, you often have that feeling, right? And so I share this because a community of practice, sometimes it can start out of something. You know, the energy and the momentum, you'll spot where that is. The energy and momentum can occur in very different areas, but sometimes it's out of a workshop or a meeting or a presentation and everyone just says, oh, I want to do more. And then people disband and then, you know, you don't kind of keep that energy going. So um, I volunteered to reconvene us as, and I just, I don't know, I started using the term community of practice and then I started reading about it and understanding the theory. And this is how things started. So what did we learn? We are currently still um, convening as a community of practice. We are interdisciplinary. We're very focused on, uh, on our um, research and publication. We're very collegial. 
We um, review each other's cases in round tables, which is really wonderful. Uh, we've been able to have interdisciplinary connections that we wouldn't have had otherwise. So I'm writing a case with Jean Slick that's related to disaster management. Um, Virginia McKendry's been involved, um, and she's, write, she's capturing a live case in, from the School of Communication and Culture. I've um, written a case with Hassan uh, Wafai uh, and also one of his graduate students, so we've built in a graduate student. And these are all cases that we've taught with and that we have uh, published, so it's really exciting. So, so, yes, sometimes you need to have some impetus. Back to the points here. Um, appear willing to take a leadership role. You know, don't feel that you have to do this on your own. In fact, I would say if you want to start a community of practice, find several people who want to help you do that. Don't feel like this is something you start as an individual. I think it's more it's something that you start as a group, right? That you, you, you don't have to have all the responsibility. In fact, you shouldn't because that actually doesn't really support how a community of practice functions. It's that shared responsibility that's very necessary. And um, key learning, um, we, we actually take time to talk about what your goals are. So in our first meeting, we had this fantastic round table and we came up with all these ideas about what our purpose and goals were. Have we tackled all of these? No. Have we tackled some of them? Yes. Is it a good place to revisit? Absolutely. We, re we revisit it frequently. Um, and the other piece that I just want to share uh, before passing on to Jen is about uh, thinking about how you're going to, for want of a better word, I love the word curate, <laughs> it's kind of got that, but how are you going to collect and gather the different um, things that you create as a group? All those fantastic insights and ideas that you might have on a flip chart or that are written on a sticky note. Um, think about how you're going to actually capture that information. Perhaps it's visually, perhaps it's in a video, perhaps it's in many multiple ways, and, uh, and capture it. So our interdisciplinary case research group, we're just capturing it right now on Google Drive. <laughs> it just is, is, is where it currently resides, but it's captured. And each of these folders is really helpful. So for example, we've got an ethical review here that other people can look at when they're actually going to put their ethical review in. For an act, for a, to write a case, to see what's been submitted. Oh, yeah. So those kinds of things. Okay. And then this one is um, underneath. We're going to talk about program head community of practice, but this one, the curation, is in Moodle, on a Moodle site. All right. And here's uh, another example of a group, a community that was born of challenges. I think that women were facing, or that face in general, but we're facing here as well, and, and a few started to come together and talk, and then it grew and burgeoned out into a bigger community and a little bit more of a formal community of practice. Bringing people together, the impetus were, was a cultural tension and incongruities across the institution, uh, I think across the world, frankly, as well, but that we were feeling and recognizing and wanting to navigate and resolve. Why not? Um, we started with le women in leadership roles across the university. Uh, it also was spurred by, it's interesting, I think the impetus often comes from an event or an experience. So it started with our symposium on women in leadership, which really, I think, came from, you know, a conversation around our uh, 25th anniversary, et cetera, et cetera. So little sparks were happening, and it's about a couple of people recognizing that this seems to be um, a topic of interest and that perhaps we should convene, right, a community around it. Spending time at the beginning to establish clarity around the language we are going to use, our purpose, various foci, and the same little list. I remember I still have it in all the, uh, the meeting invites, this long list of possibilities and ideas. It's important to capture that. But there was some navigation required, and I would say it's ongoing, figuring out um, how to how to communicate about the group, and do we need to communicate? So these are questions that keep coming up because it's maybe a little more of a touchy subject than writing cases, right? Something more tied to our practice. However, this is so tied to our practice as individuals in the organization. It's, it's um, expanded into something more around inclusive leadership is our latest term, although I discovered another one today, compassionate leadership, which I think you, know, you were grasping for a minute ago. This idea of how do we lead in a way that's compassionate, supportive, facilitative. 
Um, some of the learnings, how do we orient new members? How do we even decide on membership? Uh, it started as a, a group of women in leadership, and what does that even mean? So having to wrestle with those kinds of, uh, that question of membership in the group, maybe opening it up further. And the idea of leadership was, is an interesting one within this COP because there's a reliance on the facilitator but a desire by the facilitator to participate, right? You saw that model that um, Rebecca was sharing. And that's probably the one we struggle with the most in all the COPs we've participated in, is how do we share the leadership more and, or, or and get people to take it on? <laughs> because they tend to look to the one person who kind of started it. And really, that, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. How, it can be. You can be that facilitator that's convening and curating and being um, in that role of you know, introducing process to help the group achieve their goals. Doesn't mean you're this top-down leader, but, uh, but that would be nice to share that role, right, so that you can fully participate. It was like being a director in a school. You often wanted to participate, but you ended up being kind of a facilitator. You need to take that hat off sometime. Uh, the communications, not only across the institution, sharing what's going on, but also with one another. So what are those forums that we're choosing to use? We've created a website. It's been utilized for a number of research projects and a great place to kind of store things. Um, but deciding on what those channels of communication will be. Tip typically, we do a lot of our communication through our meeting invite. There's a lot stored in there, and it keeps it sustained so that things are remembered but can be added, uh, and that's, that can be uh, incredibly helpful. I want to speak uh, fairly briefly about this one because I'm just noticing the time. And we <laughs> so um, the program head community of practice, um, I, I've had a program head responsibilities uh, for four years, and I was starting to feel um, it was starting to be a burden, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, so um, I wanted to turn that around because I felt fairly isolated uh, around what I was doing and I, I felt a lot of pressure and I felt spread very thin. And so, um, so we, I, I wanted to turn that around and make it very, po put into something very positive <laughs> um, and to, to think more about um, all aspects of the role and to work with other people who have that role to say, what do we want it to be and what do we get excited about and, and what draws us to it because there are many things that are, are really positive about it. It's, it can be a very influential role and how can we help each other be better? And so that's how this community of practice was established. And so back to the idea of identity, I'm just sharing that with you quite openly, you know, that that was an, an individual process that I personally went through. Other people in that group came into that that process into that community with very, very different experiences, but that was, that was it for me. And um, so uh, required to launch, in this case, there was a little bit of political negotiation because we, we didn't want um, this group to be misconstrued in any way. You know, we're, we're getting together to make things better and to work together collectively, productively. And so that's what we wanted to ensure was, was understood. And so, um, BJ really helped us with that, and also um, Matt Tynes, um, she um, communicated with him about what we were doing, and um, so that was very, very helpful. Um, very, in this particular group, it's been so, so valuable to have BJ as our supporter and curator. So she helped us get the Moodle site set up. Um, she has helped us with the continuity of our meetings and just keeping us on track. And uh, that, that has been just, just wonderful. Um, so, that's it. so this is a community of practice with, with that outside support, whereas the other ones don't really have that. And uh, I can say it's certainly been, been a huge, huge asset. Uh, we had um, some things I wanted to talk about, just about this community of practice, is that we've really focused with this one on having collaborative leadership. In other words, I didn't want this community of practice to uh, feel again that this was, I was trying to move away from feeling that things were all resting on my shoulders, I, I, and they're not, but that's where my head was around the program head work, for example. So in this case, we've really encouraged collaboration, and the way that we've done that is that we have different uh, members facilitate our meetings. So we might have one member facilitate a couple of meetings, and they'll have a pass on to the next 
uh, members who are going to facilitate our meetings. Sometimes it's one person or sometimes it's two. And, um, and that's been really wonderful because we hear different voices and we explore and, uh, different approaches and, and the responsibility is shared, which is really wonderful. We have a strong practice orientation and we're really focusing on pulling our conversations back to practice intentionally in those meetings and that's very helpful. And, um, and really that inclusivity and open flow of ideas. So it's, it's been an interesting uh, group. Uh, it's, it's um, the size of it has kind of goes in and out depending on people's availability, but we just keep going and we've been very good about, if you're not there, it's great having this, this is why having the information on Moodle curated is so valuable because if a person cannot attend, they're still part of the meeting and they're still involved in that communication. Great, I just want to build on that a little bit too. There are a couple of other communities going on. I'll just go back to that. Yeah. Yeah. Focus. Um, a couple of other groups that have formed as well. And spinning off of this one and also the women in leadership, the importance of um, the practice orientation. These are about developing strategies, solutions, ways forward, new ideas, partnerships, and they have definitely accomplished that. Uh, it's actually difficult to document how many, but I try to capture them, you know, in our list to show people that, hey, this is sparking into a million different directions we're producing. Because I think what we get caught up in and, and what in a, actually inhibits us from this open flow and shared leadership is the desire to do and be productive and somehow capture what we're doing. And, and yet we are. That's all happening, of course. As soon as you ask someone a question, things are happening and they're on their way, right? Um, but but recognizing it's difficult, uh, that we do need to be conscious of the fact that these are different models for us and that we're used to the top-down hierarchical kind of approach, no matter how wonderful and community-focused we are and collaborative, we default to that model and we carry things on our shoulders. So to have a convener step in, that's really beautiful because it does allow everybody to be more shared in their leadership roles or to have people volunteer to take on the next one. That can be incredibly productive, so we want to highly emphasize the value of that because it takes the burden off the one person. And, um, and that, that it really is about generating solutions and strategies and ways forward, but there is that messy part at the beginning where people might need to vent, program had one, <laughs> or they might, or in the women leadership as well, or you know, feel a little uh, imposter-like in the case one, I don't know if I can get anything written or do anything or publish anything. That needs to be messy for a while, so to tolerate that mess for a, for a little bit of time anyway, and understand that that's part of the process and gaining some clarity around our direction and our, and our list of things we could possibly do. And I, I love that openness as well, that you're just creating this list. A couple of other groups that have formed have been around a desire by the faculty to have more you know, information flowing in to inform the development of our programs. And finally, we kind of woke up and went, well, we, we know a lot of stuff. If we just you know, we talk to each other and learn from one another, we will learn about the trends in all the different areas in which we, we function at Rural Roads. And, uh, and just sharing that information will help develop our programs, right? So what we really need to do is simply come together as a group of faculty and share what's going on in our various uh, fields. And then discuss and be creative about ways that can inform program development here at Rural Roads. And that's been fabulous on a number of fronts. Uh, it's been very easy to share the leadership. I'm a convener, bring it together with the support of, of the RUFA and the leadership team. But the, the leadership is really everywhere, and everyone's quite comfortable with being still very focused. I would say the topic is the leader. The, the idea of the future university or the trends that are going to affect learning into the future, that's at the center, and people really do galvanize, or galvanize around that, and the food. There's usually some sushi, <laughs> uh, but that's very helpful. And so the way that evolved was, was in kind of a beautiful example of a community practice. I think that's working well and has quite a good sustained energy. It could be the fact it's in a pub as well, I don't know, but, um, oh, and there was one more. What's our fifth one? Trends and, oh, and learning, the learning and teaching model. It started with a little conversation Bridget and I were having around 
Oh, again, galvanizing around something with real meaning and purpose, which to me was the model, to, to her and I both, the model. What can we do around the model? Because it, if we galvanize around the model, the energy and the clarity and the congruity of our culture at the university will really thrive and grow. And so, yeah, we just kind of carried that forward and then it turned into, well, it is kind of time to revisit our model and off it went into a group. Now, that one's a little more, I wouldn't even call it a community practice though because it's very structured. It's become very much a dean-led, you know, and it just, we've defaulted. So I wanted to highlight that one as uh, an emergent group that then became quite a committee. <laughs> and a committee is different than a community of practice. Still, it's very productive. I would say it's quite well sustained, but in a more formal way, which doesn't reflect the, pro the, the principles. But so what? What's the difference and what do we gain from one or the other? They're both working. They're both achieving a lot. One's more emergent. Uh, the other one was emergent, but it took on this shape. So maybe I, I, I think in reflecting on it, it's okay if it becomes a committee or it becomes something more formal, you know, as long as you're accomplishing your goals. And sometimes um, form follows function, right? So we, well, all the time probably, but form follows function in that case, and it can be better to be more structured for that situation or that case. All right, we want to finish with a little conversation uh, at your tables or with a buddy exploring these questions. So if you were to imagine a community of practice within your own realm, these are some helpful questions to ask yourself and others who are interested. Um, and why don't you give it a go right now?